My name is Henry Smith, and I want to tell you the story of how unions began and why workers in Canada joined. We need to travel back to medieval Europe, where most people were peasants, farming land controlled by feudal lords. In England, as early as the 1500s, the lords began to fence off communal lands. This process of enclosures made some peasants into dependent workers, who relied almost exclusively on wages. The government always made sure that employers had the upper hand. Restrictions prevented workers from leaving to seek better wages or conditions. Masters and Servants Acts required workers to contract for long periods and made workers' resistance criminal offences. Employers could dismiss workers for many reasons, but workers accused of violating their contract were often arrested and brought before hostile magistrates. Fearing revolt, the government eventually enacted a series of poor laws. The first such law, in 1536, was called an act for the punishment of sturdy vagabonds and beggars. Most of the time, the unemployed were forced back to their home parish and put to work in the workhouse. Families were broken up, children were apprenticed off to farmers and other employers. Gradually, the economic system changed, and capitalism first emerged in Britain and the Netherlands. Long-distance trade and new technologies dramatically increased production. This process of industrialization required large numbers of workers to toil in the first manufactories. The factory owners began breaking down jobs into distinct parts that could be done by untrained workers. Some even hired women and children because they always preferred to employ the cheapest labor possible. Employers exploited workers in ways that would be considered intolerable today, leading to frequent injury and early death. The new class of capitalists gained vast profits and put this money back into more machinery and their own luxurious consumption. Only property owners could vote, and basic rights to speak out or organize did not exist. As artisan workshops gave way to factory operations, skilled workers tried to deal collectively with employers. Many, such as masons and bootmakers, belonged to guilds. Guilds could determine the qualifications for apprenticeship and for becoming a journeyman, as well as what they would charge and how much they would produce. By 1800, British law regarded unions as combinations in restraint of trade, and the penalties for trying to form a union were severe. The tall puddle martyrs served as an example. These six farm laborers in Dorset, England, formed a friendly society of agricultural laborers in 1832 to pressure employers to stop decreasing their wages. They were arrested, tried, found guilty of swearing a secret oath, and deported to Australia. The governments of Western Europe conquered far-off lands to supply raw materials for industry and cheap food for their rapidly growing populations. When the French and their rivals, the English, began to colonize what would become Canada, the settlers found an inhospitable but bountiful land that was already well populated by native peoples. Canada's regions developed distinctly because commodities like fish, fur, lumber, wheat, and minerals were exported. The cod fishery and the fur trade were the first two important European industries in Canada. Both were controlled by small numbers of rich merchants who relied on European and indigenous workers to harvest and process the fish and fur. Work in early Canada was dangerous and difficult. Some of the workers were indentured servants from Europe and both African and indigenous slaves. By the 1800s, many Canadians supported themselves as independent farmers, fishers, or craft workers. Entire families contributed to produce and sell goods. Wage earning was most often seasonal. Few waged work opportunities lasted year-round. Yet a growing number of wage workers were required to extract resources and construct the canals and railways needed to transport goods. Toronto and Hamilton grew into cities, joining Montreal, Canada's first city. Gradually, women and children were no longer employed for wages as frequently as men. 
Company towns relied on the production of a single resource, like coal, and provided some stability for the skilled workers. When violence erupted, usually because of the grinding conditions endured by unskilled labourers, the companies would close the company-owned store or call in the militia. When confronted with a sudden strike by rough labourers, some employers could replace the rebellious employees with other hungry immigrants. Many navvies or canal builders faced this in the 1830s in Ontario and Quebec, as did miners in Cape Breton and railway construction workers in Western Canada in the early 20th century. From the 1840s onward, skilled craftsmen like iron molders, carpenters, joiners and cigar makers founded dozens of trade union brotherhoods. So many, in fact, that by the 1850s, Canadian newspapers accused them of leading an insurrection of labour. Craft workers took advantage of periodic upswings to join unions and made substantial gains for their families when their skills were most in demand. In the 1870s, over 200 strikes were recorded, triple the level of work stoppages in the previous decade. When economic times were bad, even unions of skilled workers found employers unwilling to bargain. Craft unions in Canada began to come together as a labour movement when they established local assemblies and joined British and American unions in their trade. Canada's first unified working class movement came about when craft workers formed leagues to reduce the working day to nine hours, first in Hamilton and then rapidly elsewhere. In their own bid to secure a nine hour day, Toronto printers went on strike in 1872. Their employers had 18 printers arrested. Seizing an opportunity to gain workers' favour, the government passed the Trade Unions Act. Unions were legal for the first time, but many restrictions also limited their power. Employers were under no obligation to recognise or bargain with a union, and picketing remained a criminal offence. Large parades around this time were becoming regular labour festivals. Craft unionists proudly showed off the important place they'd established for themselves in their communities. They believed the skills that earned decent wages and social respectability made them an aristocracy of labour. Their celebrations were the forerunners of Labour Day. My name is Vassil Aliniak, and I have a story to tell you about industrial unions and workers in Canada for almost 100 years since Confederation. Our lives were forever transformed by factories, which grew and spread because the railway linked distant communities and opened markets. At first, craft unions flourished. They resisted employers' efforts to destroy apprenticeships and control the labor process. New types of skilled workers, like machinists and locomotive engineers, eagerly formed unions. But they put up walls around each trade to keep out competitors, and the great majority of workers were still excluded from the modest gains achieved by skilled workingmen. This set the stage for the great upheaval. In the 1880s, politicized workers became interested in an aggressive new unionism to improve conditions for all workers. Socialists in British coal mining towns created all-in unions for the first time. Life in tight-knit industrial towns or neighborhoods encouraged a sense of solidarity and community-wide unionism. The Knights of Labor were one of the first unions to organize the unskilled and include women and black workers. They promoted the ideal of the honest working man. Established in the United States, the Knights quickly spread through Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, forming almost 450 local assemblies. Their success so concerned the government, it was one reason for appointing the Royal Commission on the Relations of Labor and Capital in 1886. The new unions faced many obstacles. First, craft unions expelled their own members if they also joined an industrial union. Secondly, employers could easily fire employees suspected of organizing a union. And of course, governments and courts frequently intervened in labor conflicts on behalf of employers to protect the so-called industrial peace. 
even the Industrial Disputes and Investigation Act of 1907 did little to redress the power imbalance between unions and employers. Nevertheless, early industrial unions were able to extract some concessions. Unionized coal miners, for example, forced employers and the state to make their occupation less murderous. Many workers also joined or supported socialist or labor parties, which were increasingly successful in electing their own candidates. Still, others doubted meaningful reform could be achieved through the ballot box and turned instead to ideas of revolution. The industrial workers of the world aim to unify all workers into one union to overthrow the capitalist system. The Wobblies, as they were called, rapidly gained support in Western Canada. Fearful of the IWW's commitment to free speech and direct action, employers and the government recruited labor spies and vigilantes and would arrest or simply murder Wobblies. When the Great War erupted, many workers made a bloody sacrifice on Europe's battlefields. Joining the military meant, among other things, earning a steady wage. Failing to entice enough recruits, the government conscripted more. Conscription angered many workers. They resented wartime profiteering and their bosses' unwillingness to recognize unions. Prices rose faster than wages. More than 400 strikes erupted in 1919, prompting a worried government to establish another inquiry, the Royal Commission on Industrial Relations. The Winnipeg General Strike, and sympathy strikes like it, symbolized this great labor revolt. Delegates at the Western Labor Conference in Calgary formed the One Big Union and sent fraternal greetings to comrades in the newly formed Soviet Union. The 1920s did not roar for working-class families. Many were unemployed and at least half were poor, struggling constantly for food, shelter and clothing. It was a period of retreat for organized labor. Most employers took advantage of the downturn to fire troublemakers, roll back wages, and install company unions. A minority of large companies implemented welfare schemes and joint labor management councils to co-opt workers and secure workplace harmony. By 1929, untrammeled capitalism led to a spectacular market crash. A decade of depression ensued. About one million Canadians were unemployed, or one in four workers. Many left home to scavenge, and single men were sent to work camps. Unemployed workers organized the On to Ottawa Trek, a cross-country march starting in Vancouver that the RCMP violently disbanded in Regina. Poverty and despair increased the appeal of radical politics, and workers embraced new political parties. The Communists organized the unemployed and families on relief. The Cooperative Commonwealth Federation would eventually form the first socialist government in North America when Tommy Douglas became Premier of Saskatchewan. The sit-down strikes of U.S. auto workers and early successes of the newly formed Congress of Industrial Organizations inspired industrial workers in Canada. When General Motors sped up production in Oshawa, and refused to recognize union representatives, more than 4,000 workers walked out. The strike was won in 15 days, marking a coming of age of industrial unionism in Canada. The 1935 Wagner Act, part of the New Deal in the United States, compelled private sector employers for the first time to bargain with union representatives. Some Canadian provinces followed suit, including Alberta in 1938. But it was not until 1944, when the federal government declared Privy Council Order No. 1003, that a new regime of compulsory collective bargaining began to affect all of Canada. The government was trying to maintain wartime production, because full employment had encouraged Canadian workers to strike in unprecedented numbers. The system of modern industrial relations was cemented by strikes after the war, like Fort Windsor, which led to what is called the Rand Formula. The labor movement accepted a major trade-off, giving up on workplace militancy and attempts to control production to instead pursue gradual increases in purchasing power. This was the post-war compromise, 
and in the golden years that followed, social programs of the welfare state provided security. Negotiated wage increases and benefits improved the standard of living for many Canadians, especially for members of industrial unions. But unions were expected to behave responsibly and were legally required to police their own members. During the Cold War, the struggle against the Soviet Union became the pretext for unions to purge progressive thinkers and for governments to enact restrictive anti-union legislation. For labor, the future looked uncertain. Hi there, my name is Chantelle Turgeon, and I have a story to tell you about how government employees came to think of themselves as workers and surged to the forefront of Canadian labour. In the first half of the 20th century, Parliament and provincial legislatures grudgingly supported collective bargaining between workers and private sector employers. The public sector was considered different. Government employees saw themselves as civil servants and had no say in their working conditions. The few jobs governments created were doled out to individuals with connections to elected officials. A change of government meant wholesale firings of civil servants. In 1885, Manitoba was the first province to legislate a Civil Service Act and made it clear that any request for a raise shall be considered as a tendering of the resignation. The view that public sector workers were servants persisted for decades. As late as 1964, Quebec's premier proclaimed the Queen does not negotiate with her subjects. Post offices were among the earliest public services to organize. The wages of letter carriers failed to keep up with rising costs of living. They were not awarded even a single salary increase for 30 years. The Railway Mail Clerks Association formed in 1889, a union of letter carriers formed two years later, and of postal clerks in 1911 but they were lobby groups rather than recognized collective bargaining agents. During the turbulent years around World War I, civil servants faced high inflation and followed the lead of private sector workers who established unions. Firefighters in Edmonton, for example, organized and won a collective agreement. Teachers at this time were angry that school boards decided unilaterally to dock pay for the war effort. By 1921, two-thirds of Alberta's teachers had joined the ATA and there had been a major strike of Edmonton teachers. Governments were typically intolerant of strikes and reacted harshly, especially against those it considered instigators. In 1924, a national strike of postal workers was broken by wholesale dismissals. Police who struck in Quebec and in Toronto met the same fate. Such firings set an example and helped discipline the remaining workers. The government managed to suppress attempts of public workers to organize, in part because the civil service remained small right up until World War II, when barely 8% of the Canadian workforce was employed in education, health, or government service. Divisions among public employees also contributed to the problem. For example, efforts by a union to organize all federal workers met resistance from white-collar workers who regarded themselves as a cut above the blue-collar. The large number of classifications in the federal civil service encouraged competition that obstructed efforts to create unions. Changing conditions in the post-war years eventually helped unions make major breakthroughs in the public sector. The example of industrial unions was contagious, and public employees envied the new rights and steady increases in purchasing power won by many workers. The public sector began to grow rapidly, both in size and complexity, and more workers were required to deliver the new programs of the welfare state. Hospitals, schools, and suburbs grew in step with Canada's population and affluence. Most new union members from the mid-1960s forward were civil servants, municipal employees, healthcare workers, teachers, and others. Many worked in occupations that had no private sector counterparts, like air traffic controllers and lighthouse keepers. Steady growth in government employment meant that by the end of the 1960s, one in five workers was a public employee. In the decade after it was founded in 1963, the Canadian Union of Public Employees doubled its membership and passed the United Steelworkers to become Canada's largest union. 
It was a sort of industrial-style union of the public sector. The face of organized labor was changing quickly. Public sector unions like CUPE gained hundreds of thousands of female members, reflecting the rapid growth of paid employment for married women. The 1960s were a remarkable time of new militancy, especially in Quebec, where the Quiet Revolution was underway. Students and feminists protested, and a new generation of workers led hundreds of defiant wildcat strikes from 1964 to 66. Rank-and-file union members angrily challenged the deal of the post-war settlement, surprising not only employers and government, but also union officials. For public employees, the illegal national postal strike in 1965 was decisive. By 1967, the Public Service Staff Relations Act became law, giving federal employees the right to choose between compulsory arbitration, mediation, or a strike. At long last, public employees had collective bargaining rights similar to private sector workers. The provinces followed Ottawa's lead, and the provincial civil service associations all became unions. By the early 1970s, every province had accepted some form of collective bargaining with its employees, except Ontario and Alberta, which both refused to concede public workers the right to strike. The Canadian labour movement would continue to grow for only about a decade. Union density peaked in the mid-1980s, with over 40% of Canadian workers organised in unions. Unionized public employees came to outnumber union members from the mostly male industrial workforce, which had begun shrinking. Starting in the 1960s and increasingly thereafter, foreign-owned corporations began to shut down branch plants in Canada, laying off hundreds and even thousands of mill and factory workers at a time. By 1970, Canada had tipped into a serious recession that made it seem futile to go on organizing. The deindustrialization of the Great Lakes region devastated private sector unions and also meant that unionized public sector workers increasingly found themselves as the vanguard of a weakened labor movement. It was a tough time to be a unionist. Soaring inflation, economic stagnation and the energy crisis of 1973 all gave big business and the state the excuse they needed to crack down on unions. Wage controls nearly provoked a general strike in 1976, and the free trade agreements that followed increased the power of corporations and helped deregulate labor markets. Some call it neoliberalism. Some call it globalization. But whatever the name, it hasn't been good for workers or the public services they rely on. More and more people count themselves lucky to hold precarious McJobs with deteriorating conditions and declining real wages. If public sector unions don't defend public services, who will? I'm Sophie Guinnessio, and I want to tell you about the history of some of the most marginalized workers in Canada and their important struggles for fairness and inclusion. Workers have always been diverse, but many unions ignored the needs of some people like indigenous, immigrant, women, or lesbian and gay workers. Early on, only people considered radicals grasped important ideas now generally accepted, like organizing all workers and fighting to improve conditions for everyone. Since time immemorial, First Nations people lived off the land and shared what they produced. They made crucial contributions to our economy that have largely been ignored due to persistent negative stereotypes. Indigenous technology helped the first European explorers and settlers to survive. First Nations participation in the fur trade made possible the very earliest accumulation of wealth here. Some ran cottage industries and were independent producers. But by the 1850s, more work for wages, especially in resource extraction industries in British Columbia. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, some Indigenous people joined unions or supported the strikes of other workers. For example, Indigenous workers established some of Vancouver's first longshore unions, like the Bows and Arrows local of the Industrial Workers of the World. On the prairies, the Métis were exploited as a cheap source of agricultural labor. 
When the Red River Colony attempted to establish its own government, the military violently crushed their leaders. In 1876, the Indian Act consolidated previous ordinances that aimed to assimilate First Nations and destroy their cultures using residential schools, reserves, and other means. First Nations people gradually lost access to subsistence resources and racism limited their success in the wage economy. A cycle of economic inequality became entrenched. Corporations often only invested in Indigenous communities when promised low wage rates. When they closed operations, these communities were left to deal with contaminated soil and water. Today, the Indigenous population is growing and becoming an increasingly important part of the labour force. Some unions have understood this and begun to organize Indigenous workers. Powerful individuals ensured that a sense of Britishness and whiteness defined the dominant Canadian identity. Workers different than British Canadians faced unfair treatment. For French Canadian workers, class exploitation occurred together with cultural linguistic oppression. Because Anglophones dominated Quebec's economy, many workers embraced nationalism and fought for sovereignty. Immigration policies in Canada favored immigrants from Britain, the US, and Northern Europe to maintain the whiteness of Canada. Head taxes kept out unwanted Chinese workers, and the 1910 Immigration Act made race a restrictive legal category. Exceptions were made when there was a shortage of cheap labor. Ukrainians, Poles, Italians, and others all came to build new lives for themselves, and in doing so, they helped build Canada. In the 1960s, Restrictions were relaxed, and many workers of color from previously excluded countries in Asia, the Caribbean, and Latin America began to immigrate here. They faced challenges still familiar to immigrants today, including discrimination at work and in all areas of life, such as finding housing. Until at least World War II, most unions treated newcomers as a threat. Craft unions drove workers they deemed unacceptable out of their occupations and included race restrictions in their constitutions. Racialized workers have responded to discrimination in various ways. They sometimes open small businesses like laundries or restaurants and form their own unions, fighting for fairness, inclusion, and for their own rights. Women's stories, the family economy, and ideas about gender are integral to labor history. Capitalism and wage labor rely on vast amounts of unpaid work, much of it done by women. Until at least the 1960s, the common view was that a woman's proper role was as wife and mother, and many objected to the paid employment of women. In 1898, the Trades and Labor Congress called for the exclusion of women from the labor force. Patriarchal norms assumed that women were kept by male breadwinners, yet many women did not have husbands and many men earned well below a family wage. This meant a large number of women were always in the workforce. The jobs available to them were restricted, paid less, and considered less skilled. For example, teaching and nursing were poorly paid and lacked the status of professions. Labor shortages during the World Wars led to hiring women for blue-collar jobs normally reserved for men, including in munitions factories. But at war's end, government policy pushed women back into the home and traditional pink-collar ghettos. Women had to organize within their unions to tackle sexism in the workplace. The Alberta Federation of Labor's annual conventions lacked any resolutions addressing women's issues until 1974. A year later, Grace Hartman was elected president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees. She was the first woman to lead a major union in North America. Unions have made great strides for women. For example, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers was the first to win paid maternity leave in 1981. Union contracts now help mitigate sexual harassment and have reduced the pay gap between women and men. 
In colonial Canada, there was often an ambiguous attitude towards people who engaged in same-sex activity, especially in homosocial work environments like the cod fishery or the BC gold rushes. Though usually not in force, the law did treat lesbians and gays as criminals, and by the late 19th century, Canadian laws were changed to police same-sex activities. Employers often regarded gay or lesbian workers as suspicious or unreliable, so most lived secret double lives and concealed their sexual identity in public. In defiance of often violent repression by police and straight people, Working-class lesbians and gays in large cities established their own neighborhoods where they found a measure of safety. By the 1950s, most lesbian and gay workers still preferred to remain in the closet, but this was especially true of those employed by the state. A series of national security campaigns targeted and fired suspected lesbians and gays in the civil service. By the 1970s, same-sex workers waged a new fight for freedom from discrimination in employment, housing, and public services. Canada's first gay rights march took place in Ottawa, and the first gay liberation newspaper was published in Toronto. Most unions were slow to support these struggles. The first gay rights resolution was not heard in a union assembly until 1979 at the Ontario Federation of Labour and only after allies promised to disrupt proceedings. The first unions to demand sexual orientation protection in their collective agreements were usually those led by young feminists and socialists. Eventually, many Canadian workers and some of their unions could claim to have joined a global movement that, since the end of the 19th century, is expanding the decriminalization of homosexuality and defending the rights of sexual and gender minorities. Throughout history, employers and the government often played up differences among workers. A segregated labor market and employment discrimination have meant some groups of workers have been corralled into low-paying, undesirable, or dangerous work. Yet when workers stood united and overcame perceived differences, they took steps forward for fairness. The participation of Indigenous peoples, immigrants, women, sexual and gender minorities, and other workers in the economy and in the labor movement have made an impressive difference to everyone's well-being. Yet in spite of the great advances, much work remains to be done. Gender and racial pay gaps still persist, as do homophobia, fear, and misunderstanding. My name is Sarah Ocampo. In my spare time, I volunteer for my union's History and Archive Committee. I want to tell you about fun ways to learn history and about why preserving and sharing your own story matters. History is usually recorded from a perspective that serves the interests of rich, powerful individuals by recounting famous exploits and a narrow view of how public events were shaped. Much historical writing has ignored the presence of working class people, women, natives, and other oppressed groups. Workers have always understood that to advance their interests, they would need to take matters into their own hands. In the 1800s, unions began to publish their own newspapers because the owners of the first printing presses were unsympathetic towards workers. Similarly, workers today more than ever are actively preserving and sharing their own stories. They are rediscovering the people's history and uncovering their role in building and running this country. If workers don't record history, they risk being left out of it or recast in inaccurate roles. There are many ways the past has been preserved, and for people to learn about history. Documents kept by individuals, institutions, or governments serve as primary sources. So do artifacts, which are objects, and much more than just union memorabilia like buttons or banners. They include everything from tools to materials from homes. Workers have recorded their own history by writing down thoughts about their lives and struggles through their decisions to join or fund unions and political parties, or to participate in cultural activities. Records also exist of what workers said when they appeared in courts. Government and union records, newspapers, and other contemporary writings are also useful. 
labor historians and other social scientists dedicate themselves to researching and writing about workers. At first, they focused on the development of trade unions and workers' politics, but a new generation of historians broadened the field to examine the experience and culture of all workers. The writings of historians are valuable secondary sources. It's important, though, to always identify the political perspective of the author. Archives, libraries, and museums play an important role in collecting and disseminating workers' history. Some are even dedicated specifically to working-class heritage and arts. Research collectives, often staffed by activists, publish accessible materials from a particular region. The most vibrant of them rely on the support of volunteers and the funding of trade unions, foundations, and individual donors. Though much remains to be done, they have led the way in ensuring workers' stories are a part of both public broadcasts and the official curriculum of public schools. As technology has improved, so too has our ability to constantly and accurately record and preserve events and stories. Take images, for example. At first, only drawings, paintings, or engravings existed. Relatively few artists chose to depict workers, as doing so was at times considered subversive. Though photography was invented in 1839, it would take decades before workers were regularly featured, and even longer before cameras reached the hands of ordinary people. Early motion pictures were more concerned with providing a diversion than reflecting workers' lives, with notable exceptions. Dramas now tell the stories of characters that might as well have been real workers, and documentaries have surged in popularity. Enough films are about workers that we can now search labor film databases and attend labor film festivals. Music is a vital historical resource. Some musicians and new media specialists develop video ballads to retell workers' stories. Others have reinterpreted and recorded folk or protest songs, and many perform at working-class music festivals. Some novels have been written as historical fictions, and the roots of labor history graphic novels can be traced to a tradition of activist and underground comics that emerged in the late 19th century. Many political cartoons used by unionists to communicate left politics are now artifacts in and of themselves. Workers can sometimes find their history by watching stage plays and theater, or by following walking tours. It is up to workers themselves if public monuments, murals, and place names are to reflect their lives. Every community has a working class history worthy of its own tour. In the information age, incredible advances in computing have made a tsunami of digital resources available. Personal computers and smartphones also mean that workers record their history in new formats, like emails, blogs, and messages on social media accounts. Creative specialty websites now curate historical information, collecting digitized documents with a view to making the sentiments and struggles of workers more accessible. Unions have also established microsites that preserve and share the stories of their members. Perhaps one of the most important technological advances for preserving labor history occurred in the early 1950s, when recording on magnetic tape came into general use. Tape enabled people to conveniently record oral histories, that is, accounts of the past by word of mouth. For the first time, workers' voices could be heard directly, and interviews with ordinary people began to form the basis of social, community, and even union histories. Everyone has a story worth sharing and preserving. The stories of workers' lives matter. Working class history gives insight into today's circumstances, putting lives into a deeper and broader context. When people see themselves in history, they gain a new consciousness and understanding of how to go forward. Labor history teaches workers about their own resiliency and agency, about their ability to improve the world and shape history's outcome. They discover it is the countless small deeds of many people together who make possible the significant events that become history. And while no union was ever perfect, and many have long since disappeared, unions help unite workers and empower them to make history. Looking back, workers have faced hardships, cruelty, and exploitation. But there was also resistance and triumph, moments in which courage, compassion, and love defined the day. These stories give hope and strength to carry on today's struggles.